It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. Battery dead. Across distances they were never meant to fly. The joys of Arctic travels. To the most isolated spots on the planet. Losing an engine over the jungle is definitely something that you want to avoid. Weather is the enemy. Dude, that is lightning. That risk is real and it's it's waiting for you. But as long as there's money and fuel to burn. If it has wings, we'll fly it. They'll live to fly another day. See that? Yeah. 12,000 feet over Africa, Randy McGee and Dave Matheson are caught in a heavy storm. And their twin engine Dornier is low on fuel. Dude, we're in all sorts of trouble right now, man. I mean, wicked returns. I'm just punching us through it right now. They started in Yellowknife, Canada. Eight fuel stops and 13,000 kilometers later, they're on the last leg of their mission to deliver the Dornier to the United Nations in South Sudan. This thing just came out of nowhere. A storm eats up fuel. Randy and Dave have asked permission to fly around it. But in this part of Africa, nothing's that simple. All right, Speed, come on, pick up now. You know, man, storms in Africa are legendary, and this one doesn't look good. When they left Egypt, they already knew fuel would be tight on this long last leg of their trip. All right, man, fuel's critical. We need to take off. 202, request take position. We're ready to take off. Negative. All right. Air traffic controllers refuse to let them take shortcuts over conflict zones. Is there any chance you could approve us direct? Negative. What a dick. I say again, we will be fuel critical. It is imperative we get a straighter line than this. That means go ask your boss, dipheads. I can't give you a permission. With less than an hour worth of fuel to spare, they push on through. I've had to go pretty far off course. Actually, it's settling down better than I thought now, but the radar looks bad. You'll get some more bumps coming up here, but it won't be nothing crazy. Well, look at this, man. Now we're getting back on course here. The storm blew out of nowhere. Now, just as suddenly, it's dying down. It's going to be awesome, man. We're going to land in Juba, the newest country in the world after coming from the Arctic. It's pretty cool, man. Totally. Six years of work to get this thing to Juba. The Dornier 228 is a heavy hauler that can land on the worst African dirt airstrips. I'll be excited once we get there. Hi guys. How are you? I'm Welcome in. to Juba, South Sudan. Thank you. This is Carlos. Hello, Carlos, Carlos Randy. Carlos. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Work especially with him and his people. The plane will join the fleet of the United Nations World Food Program, transporting aid workers and supplies all over South Sudan. This flight was like none other that I've ever done because I honestly believe this airplane being here is going to save people's lives and it's going to help people and make their country better and make their lives better. And uh, it meant something to me to be a part of that. Randy and Dave's job is done. For the Dornier, the real work now begins, helping the world's newest country get on its feet. Back in the US, on the east coast of Florida. Guaranteed, and if we don't? Boss Corey Benson is busy lining up Randy's next job. Whatever, okay, bye. Now we can't leave tomorrow. We don't have insurance. 
they, they guaranteed me I'd have it yesterday, then they guaranteed me we have it today so we could leave tomorrow morning, and we can't go. Corey's a pilot, but lately he's become a risk-taking entrepreneur, selling and delivering planes around the world. Looks pretty good. It looks like they just updated and put a Garmin 530 in it, which is a much nicer GPS. Corey has a lot riding on this delivery. Oh, master on? Yeah, master on. For the second time in as many months, he's tackling the world's hottest market for small planes. Brazil is really hot right now. Um, their economy's doing really well. There's a lot of people buying airplanes, so we put a big emphasis down there. It really gives us the edge, and it's, it's helped us build this company very quickly. Nav light. Strobe. Corey has less than 48 hours to make sure this plane is ready to go before Randy shows up. And this is not the only delivery Corey has on his books. He's got another job lined up across the Atlantic. Right. And he's hired two new pilots to take on this flight. Hey, hey. Hey. What's up, Rockstar? What's going on? How Yo, you doing, Show man? some man love, brother. How you doing? Good. Pete Zaccanino comes highly recommended. There's nothing better than being the business owner and knowing that you have pilots like Pete that can fly anything and has flown everything. Um, he was a test pilot for half the planes out there, it seems like. So it's, a, it's an incredible, almost a bragging right to be able to say that uh, Pete's one of my pilots. Pete is one of the busiest and best pilots in the US. Gloves, helmet, oxygen. He races jets and he's a test pilot. In most cockpits, that makes him a top gun. Pete will be flying this mission with Brad White, a younger pilot with less flying time, but eager to learn. If there was anyone that I could say in my career that could be a mentor, it would be him. Because he's done more, he's flown more airplanes than anyone I've ever flown with. But for veteran Pete, there's a dark cloud hanging over this mission. What happened at Reno? This is that nuts, was, man. Yeah, it was bad. Friend of yours? Yeah, yeah, I knew Jimmy. It was a bad deal. Yeah. Four days ago, at an air show in Reno, Nevada, Pete witnessed a very personal tragedy. One of his friends crashed his plane into the stands, killing himself and 10 spectators. This is a catastrophic failure. This is bad. Oh, man. So, but you're, you're feeling OK? Uh, you're... Yeah, you got to move forward. And... It sucks, but uh, you know, it happens. Yeah, it does suck. It was, so it was pretty horrible. A tragedy at Reno, as sad as it is, and unfortunate as it is, does not shake me. You have to move forward from it. You cannot be looking back at it, because fear will kill your mind. And if you're establishing fear in your mind from a tragedy and observing a tragedy, you shouldn't fly. So this is it right here. Hey, I like it a lot. Hey, it's actually, I was a little concerned about it. I didn't know if it was in good shape or if it was an old uh, beater that we had to, to, to move. It looked pretty nice. The plane they have to move is a twin-engine King Air, a $2 million eight-seater with some major modifications. The King Air is the beast. It's an earlier King Air. It's in good shape, but they put in these big motors. So this thing is uh, raging. It wants to get up and go fly. And there's plenty of flying ahead. 7,500 kilometers from the UK to Iceland and Greenland, on to Canada, and finally south to Quincy, Illinois, four days from now. And our flaps are up. Those are some white cliffs. Those are some white cliffs. Did you ever think you'd be in the king here at 2,000 feet off the uh, cliffs of Dover? <laughs> I actually did not. I'm just saying. Kind of cool, though. That's very cool. Cool to the wind. But the sightseeing is cut short when Pete notices something wrong. Right field gauge is not producing. OK. This one's dropped down, you know, where it's at. This one doesn't move. One of the plane's fuel gauges is still showing a full tank, but they've already been flying for half an hour. 
think we're going to cut our flight short. That is a good call. Being Air 78 Quebec, Romeo Roger, we're going to start our turnaround and return to shore. A faulty fuel gauge is bad enough, but Pete knows it could be a sign of a more serious problem. Capitan! Corey B. Nice ride. In Florida, a tired but upbeat Randy McGee shows up for his new mission. How are we doing? How's it going, man? Doing good. It's hot. Corey Benson gave Randy short notice on this delivery job. So how you doing, Randy? I know you had a long all-nighter to get here. Man, I haven't slept much. I haven't eaten for like 16 hours, but uh, I'll be all right. I owe a lot of the success of my business to Randy. He really helped me get up um, get this company off the ground and, and delivering these planes. There's no way I could have delivered some of these planes without him. The plane looks good. It's just been this insurance nightmare. For the last week, it's been complete bull but we, we finally have it settled, so we're ready to go. There she is. As Corey's designated expert pilot, Randy's job is to get the plane and its crew to their destination, alive. My part of that process is to move this airplane and make sure the airplane gets there safely. If, if we don't deliver the plane, we didn't do our job either. The plane is a 1991 Beechcraft Bonanza, a high-performance aircraft with a deadly reputation for killing inexperienced pilots. These are the doctor killers, huh? <laughs> that won't be a problem for us because I barely made it out of high school, man, so. <laughs> In the late 40s, the first Bonanzas came with a V-tail that reduced the drag on the plane. But the design also came with a high fatality rate. A lot of guys died in this, but really the theory is that doctors are very confident and put themselves in situations that they thought they could handle, but obviously couldn't. And Just in over their head, get their pilot's license, so, and then go buy a high-performance complex plane. After the V-tail got too much bad press, it was discontinued in 1982. I think we gotta take it flying here. I mean, it definitely looks like an old plane. If Randy sounds skeptical, it's because he knows what lies ahead. A 6,000 kilometer long trek from Florida to Cuyaba, Brazil, with six pit stops and a treacherous pass over the dense jungle of the Amazon. The only way to find out if this bonanza is up for it is to get it off the ground. Clear. Clear. And we're off. El Capitan. All right, Corey, everything looks coupled up pretty good there. You're Great. coming up. The gear's not. I didn't hear the gear, did you? That's not coming up. The gear's not coming up. We got a gear problem. The landing gear should retract into the belly of the plane, but it won't budge. Why is it stuck down? That doesn't make any sense. I'd rather be stuck down than up, but this isn't good. Jammed landing gear is especially bad right now. Corey doesn't have time for repairs. The insurance issues already have him behind schedule. Dude, this is ridiculous. After all the other delays, we cannot have another delay. If this landing gear is a problem, I'm gonna be pissed. Hey man, I don't even wanna hear about it right now. We gotta fix this problem and get it on the ground safely and then we'll worry about the rest. So, oh, this, just drop it, dude. This isn't the first time Corey and Randy have butted heads over their competing agendas. We need to get going though. We have to get it there tonight. If Randy thinks Corey is putting his deadlines ahead of crew safety... We don't have to do anything. ...he doesn't hesitate to pull rank on the boss. If it gets too late, we'll just have to stay. And Tower uh, 91 Whiskey Echo would like to return for landing uh, with the possible gear failure. Making that delivery deadline now looks impossible. This is ridiculous. I understand, man. Let's just get it on the ground here first.
high over the cliffs of Dover. Pete and Brad are test flying the King Air, a souped up plane they call the Beast. What's our fuel flow, 250? Yeah, a little under even. Getting it ready to fly all the way to Illinois. But Pete's just found a problem. Well, that fuel gauge definitely is not moving. A broken fuel gauge is a no-fly item. When we're in flight, if we developed a fuel leak, the only way often that we would know that is our fuel gauge. Pete isn't taking any chances. He's aborting the test flight. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. And that's the attitude I bring to that aircraft. The plane's trying to kill me. It's not my friend. And it has to prove to me it's safe. So we're sure that that uh, fuel gauge is just stuck? Well, not, yeah. Not going into a nice imbalance? If the fuel is flowing to just one engine, the plane will be dangerously off kilter when they try to land. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right there. Yep. Pete banks the plane back and forth to rule that out. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have a fuel imbalance going on and have to land with this massively heavy wing. That is a good call. Fuel imbalance would be bad enough on a test flight, but a disaster if it hit them on their longest leg. If we had that over the Atlantic and turned out to be a genuine fuel transfer issue, that can turn into a serious emergency where you could lose fuel to one engine. OK, runway is tight. And we'll keep our eyes open for birds. Pete's first landing of the beast is a rocky one. I ah, like that bird right there. Nope. He and Brad have a long list for the mechanics. Gear doors on the left side, the co-pilot's audio is poor, and the right fuel gauge is sticking at 685 pounds. And uh, also, uh, it was a crappy landing. <laughs> The Beast handles a little bit differently than other King Airs because of the modifications. It's got bigger propellers up front, and that changes how it lands. It has a different feel to it. So I got a leash on it right now, but it still bites at my leg every now and then. Malcolm, what do you think for all those items to be up and running, ready to go? Well, we'll take a look at the fuel system straight away. OK. The plugs, uh, the socket's not going to be a problem. Yeah, That's probably a connection there. We'll take a look now. OK. And then Great. come up with a plan. OK. Yeah. That sounds Great. good. The Beast will be a full day in the shop, a delay that won't sit too well with boss Corey Benson. I can't stress enough, guys, the urgency to get this plane to the new owner. He is needing this airplane extremely quickly for his business. Yeah, that's a Roger. I guess it's time to fly and get that plane fixed. Let's get in the air. Roger that. Two days later, Pete and Brad are back in the air, gunning for the airport in Reykjavik, Iceland. What do you think about coming in here at night? If it's dark, then we just shoot it as precisely as possible, because there's a lot of stuff to hit out there. Yeah. We have a lot of obstacles. We have mountains, volcanoes, and I'm tired. Since leaving the UK, they've logged about 1,100 kilometers in the King Air. The plane is performing well, but Pete still doesn't trust it enough to land after dark. When I don't know a plane, I don't trust it, and I tend to avoid night flying in that airplane until it proves to be a safe and reliable aircraft. Well, what we're gonna do is turn everything up as fast as possibly to make this plane go. Even five minutes faster to get there is gonna help and hopefully not land in the dark. Not the landing, it's all the obstacles and mountainous terrain. Pete opens up the throttle, pushing the King Air up to top speed. So he just gave us right there two knots by pushing the prop levers up to red line. And we're just coming up with ideas on what we can do to get there as fast as we can. The red line strategy works. Pete and Brad shave off enough time to arrive half an hour before sunset. Wow, final, don't have the traffic. Turn left heading at 290, maintain 4,000 feet. To make this landing, they have to come in high or risk slamming into a mountain. 
Maintaining 4,000 feet with the field in sight. Check your altimeter setting at oh. showing at 3,000 feet. Oh, we totally blew that. They're 1,000 feet lower than they thought, too close to the ground. How many uh, times do we brief that? That's what dude. fatigue does to you. They've set their altimeter wrong. If it were dark, oh. After sundown, this simple mistake could have killed them both. Oh. This is not an airport you want to land at in the dark. It can be a brutal journey, and fatigue is always a factor. You're flying through time zones every day, you're tired, you're eating in different places, you're at different hotels, and that adds to your fatigue. Some people disregard that, and uh, there, there are ferry pilots that crash every year. Today, Pete's in luck. Their next stop is Greenland, but the airport is closed on Sunday, so they'll have a day off. Almost 6,000 kilometers southwest in Florida, Randy's worried that the plane he and Corey are flying to Brazil might have a serious problem. There we go. Access is the killer. Always is. The landing gear retracts perfectly, some of the time. But that's not good enough for Randy. No other red liar going to no. any relay. No, white's up at pin number five, and red is down. Corey makes an average $15,000 for each plane delivery, if it's trouble free. Every day we delay, it costs us money with pilot fees and hotels and everything else. And so from a business standpoint, I'm always pushing the pilots. Hey man, we're gonna be doing this a lot. This is gonna happen. We just gotta, it's important to me too, but it's just part of the business. It's the part of the business that drives me freaking nuts. <laughs> Everything works like it's supposed to. So, you know, if we can't find find the problem to duplicate it, we can't fix it. You know, that's as simple as that. You can't fix something that's not broke. As far as Corey is concerned, if the landing gear won't retract now and then, he's willing to fly with the wheels down. But Randy would rather have all systems working perfectly. Hey, fellas, what do we got? I mean, it didn't work. And then, yeah, it worked a bunch of times. And then it didn't work, and then it worked a bunch of times. Right. And that last time, it didn't work, and it just... What I'm saying, though, is, is, is at mechanics, if the system is working, yeah. I can't find the problem. You know, we're going to be launching into the Caribbean, and if it happens again, and we don't have real mechanics around, I mean, then we're... You know what I mean? Just start changing switches. I mean, I, I don't know. That's gonna, be, I mean, that's gonna be Chuck's call. I mean, you know, what are you, what are you gonna replace? Yeah. One, two, four, three, three, four, five switches, two relays. You're talking thousands of dollars. Replacing all the switches because they can't find the bad one is an expensive call that no one wants to make. The gear is working, but not at the level that it should be working at. We can fly the airplane as is, but we have to know that the system is uh, a little quirky, and it's not working, in my mind, entirely uh, correctly. Randy finally gives in. If the landing gear won't retract, the bottom line is the plane can still fly and land. So they're finally off to Brazil. Goodbye, Florida. Are you comfortable? You look like you're pretty straight up. Oh, yeah. Stick up my ass. <laughs> well, I've known that since this is the first day I've met you. But 555 just Columbia. let me know how you're doing. We just got to make sure we don't get on each other's nerves. Sure. Well, you're always on my nerves. I just don't tell you. Yeah, man. I mean, I've been on the road three weeks straight before we even came into this, so it'd be nice to have at least one day down, you know? Far up in chilly Reykjavik, Pete and Brad are supposed to be taking the day off. We'll be taming the beast a little bit more, you know? Kind of getting used to the feel of this guy. But both pilots would rather be flying. So Pete's going to train Brad for a dangerous landing that's coming up in their trip. 
Oh, uh, we got like 20 knot winds or, or something right now, so we're just gonna go and bust out some uh, practice crosswind landings. Tomorrow, they'll be flying to Narsar Suak, a landing strip with a nasty reputation. The top 10 most dangerous airports in the world is Narsar Suak, Greenland, and you need to be experienced and have uh, your knowledge of your aircrafts all set up before you get there. Narsar Suak is surrounded by steep cliffs that create powerful wind gusts. A strong crosswind could knock the King Air off course and send it crashing down onto the icebergs below. These crosswind landings, the wind is hitting you from one side of the airplane instead of right down the nose the way you like it. The plane likes to turn into the wind at all, all times. So what we're going to do here, instead of the plane's going to be coming to the runway on a big angle like this, and Pete is going to stand on the rudder and actually end up touching down one wheel and riding on one wheel, and then put the second wheel down, the main gear, and then the nose wheel. It'll be good practice for sure. Okay, I'm gonna get your lights here for you, big dog. Thank you. Both laps. Both laps, speed check selected, moving. The first try for a one-wheel landing doesn't impress Brad. It kind of felt like they both touched at the same time. Well, you know what, you had this great slip going, it seemed right at the last minute you flattened it out. Had to to put that wing down. That sucks. All right, really roll around one, baby. Pete blows the next one. It won't do it, dude. Nope. Not moving. Full flaps. Full flaps. Engage. But number three does the job. Oh, that was buttery, dude. Yeah, baby. That was buttery. Man, that was awesome. That was kick ass. That was Dude, fun. You were killing those things. Good <laughs> job, man. Today, Brad and Pete head for Greenland, where they'll put yesterday's flying practice to the test. Hey, Pete, so I'm just reviewing some terrain charts here. They're 30 minutes from Narsarswak Airport, one of the most dangerous landings in the world, and Brad's got the controls. Could you give me a little rundown of what we might see? Yeah, we got an 8,000-foot uh, glacier that we have to contend with, so we can't just descend down. OK. Number two, the airport is in between mountains. It's in a fjord, OK? So we can't just set up nice and gradual for it. It's a steep approach. It has its terrain on left, right, and behind you and in front of you. So it's, it's rather intense, even if the weather's good. Also, there's icebergs right at the edge of the runway. All right. Pete's got a lot more experience with Narsar Swag than myself. I'm familiar with uh, mountain flying and treacherous winds and all that from my flying in Alaska, but uh, the actual airport itself, they're all different. Doesn't matter where you've been, it's where you're going. So we're going to be coming from up over here, descending down through all that crap, yeah. then having to go out over the water. Correct. And then there's icebergs in the way. Wow, we got our hands full for sure. For Brad, this is a rare chance to tackle the notorious airport. But he's glad to have Pete standing by for backup. Let's hit it. All righty. Let's get down there and uh, have a good look at these glaciers. I want you to see how bad it is. This place is nuts. Look how many fjords you have. And you miss one, you pick the wrong one, you're dead. Yeah, this is crazy. Right now, they're headed toward what could be a layer of severe turbulence. On this arrival, we've got 20 knot winds. And that fjord, this is not a flying hippo, by the way. And that fjord, it can get really aggressive with the turbulence and wind shear. I figured as much. Oh. Yeah. There you go right there. On cue. As we go floating out of our seats. Woohoo! Ooh, slowing down. Eight minutes from the runway, turbulence rocks the King Air. Brad slows the plane and pulls the nose up to reduce stress on the wings. Go ahead and pitch this beauty up. Yep, I got it. Thank you, sir. And right at cue. That was unbelievable. 
when turbulence hits like that, the first thing that comes into my mind is the wings coming off. There's design speeds because the planes can only handle so much abuse. And just when things couldn't get any worse. We just get a master warning for hydraulic fluid low. Hydraulic fluid low. Might have a gear issue here, unfortunately. That's just great. That's terrific. If ever they needed their landing gear to work. You know what, why don't we drop the gear now? Make sure we don't have a problem when we're on sh Friday. Right. Gear selected down. It's moving. We got a green on the nose. And uh, left and right. We got three green and no red. OK, cool. Well, that's, that's sorted. The gear problem has disappeared. November 7, 8, Quebec Romeo, turning final runway 07. But ahead, more to deal with. Got a long runway. It's windy and it's going to have wind shear. Yep. So, what do you think for speed? There's a big flipping icebergs out there. Holy smokes. 500. All right, let's go final flaps, please. Final flaps selected. Speed is good. With a cool head and a steady hand, Brad conquers Narsarswak. Welcome to Greenland. There we are. They've now completed three legs of their mission. Only four more to go. Far from the land of icebergs and glaciers, Corey and Randy fly over the turquoise Caribbean on their way to Brazil with working landing gear that hasn't let them down so far. Yeah, there's a ton of people on that beach. They focus, but make it look good. Got a big audience down here in Hollywood. They're coming into St. Martin, dead tired and in desperate need of some shut eye. Nice one. Yeah, good day, yeah, 317. They might get some forced time off right now. Turns out their pint-sized bonanza is too small to rate immediate attention. The handler said that there's a bunch of big airlines that they have to fuel up first, um, some of those 757s and whatnot. It's a problem ferry pilots know all too well. They only need 300 liters of fuel, so they have to wait for the big planes that might be buying 200 times as much. They're going to get the big guys out of the way before they'll come fuel up a little guy. Corey isn't happy. But for once, he isn't worried about his delivery deadline. He even decides to take advantage of the delay for some fun. This, this airport's very well known uh, because everybody can stand right up on that fence, and there's a huge planes that come in and land right on top of them. So it's going to be fun to see. I've seen it on YouTube and the internet a bunch. I've never seen it in person. have had a few high-tension moments on this trip, but by now, they've put it all behind them. <laughs> and that's a good thing, because they're gonna need all the good vibes they can get for the next leg of this journey. In Greenland, Pete and Brad have just barnstormed their way through some serious turbulence. They're one third of the way to delivering the King Air to Quincy, Illinois. Ready? Yes. While the plane is refueling, they check out the icebergs in the fjords near the airport. We're now taking a look at what's ahead of us. When we depart and head to Goose Bay, we'll be flying over a very extensive ice pack field full of icebergs. Holy smokers. Imagine having to land the airplane in that and not only survive the crash, but then you got all that to deal with. You, I mean, you're done. Look at the size of that. V 
being in Greenland reminds me a lot of Alaska, and I actually consider Alaska to be my home. With the mountains and with the glaciers, the animals, I actually got really homesick. Brad was a medevac pilot in Alaska. Now he flies as a contract pilot in Afghanistan when he's not ferry flying. He spends about eight months a year in the air. Being a pilot is definitely difficult on home and family life. You're traveling all the time, and uh, you lose a lot of friends, and you miss a lot of good times with family. Let's roll. Uh, Canada, here we come. Brad and Pete are now on their last leg across the North Atlantic. They'll head to Quebec City, and then onward to Illinois. Notes and I'm cruising through a fjord. Yep. Are you kidding me? Is this boring? That's like, yeah, that's great. Look at the mountain. This is like an average day at work in, in Alaska, man. Uh, here we go, the Alaska Irvins. Okay, and when, we, when do we stop here in those? Do I go back in Iraq for on and on? But we're not flying in Iraq. Like, we're, we're not, not in flying. Alaska right now. I know, now. but it looks exactly the same. Minus the animals. It's a neat place, it's special. It is special. You're special. <laughs> oh, for the love of poses. <laughs> 4,900 kilometers south, Corey and Randy are finally getting refueled. How are you doing? Can we get uh, both tanks topped off? Pull up. Yeah, thanks, buddy. And Corey's anxious to take off because they still have 4,000 kilometers of flying ahead over the Caribbean Sea and across South America to deliver the client's plane within four days. Hey, Corey. Yo. Yeah, let's get the hell out you of got here. Her. Yeah, let's get out of here. Corey's business has really taken off in the past two months. Bye bye, St. Martin. We'll miss you. But the schedule's been a killer. We've got 310 nautical miles to go. I'm a little tired right now. We've had uh, three long days. And we're, having, we're constantly being challenged in one way or another. We're not eating much. I'm sure we're dehydrated because we're not drinking much. We put in a lot of hours in the cockpit every day. We don't get a lot of sleep. We're jumping time zones. Our body's always trying to catch up. But yet, the type of flying we do requires the most concentration because something always goes wrong. I'm going to need your help on this flight. Always be double-checking these gauges. Every minute, you should at least run your eyes past them, maybe even a little closer than normal. OK. This one engine, we have to take care of it, so it takes care of us. Extreme fatigue is dangerous enough when conditions are perfect. But suddenly, thunderheads come out of nowhere and close in on the tiny bonanza. Feel that? Yeah, this is crazy, dude. Boy, this is gonna get rough, man. Seriously, this could be really bad. Make sure you're strapped in. Up north in Quebec City, Pete and Brad are just landing. Like butter. Hey, how's it going? Good, you? Good. Welcome to Quebec City. Hey, thanks. Back in cell phone range, Brad makes a call. We're ferrying this plane from England, and it turns out we're landing in Quincy, Illinois. He hasn't seen his mother in over a year. This may be his big chance. And I looked at the map, it's like 300 miles away, and I was wondering if there's any chance you could get down there. I never get to see my mom. She's living in Chicago, and we were taking this plane to Quincy, Illinois. I think it's about 300 miles, and I'm just kind of wondering if there's any way I can see her. You know, I'm getting a free ride there, so. 
but a severe weather system moving across the Midwest might put these plans on hold. We're up here. We got to roll all the way down here through all of this crap, three lows. This could be a real problem. This type of weather can uh, be fatal. Yeah, this can take wings off. We need to get moving, like, ASAP. Vamanos. Europe. Right away, they see that this has the makings of a major storm system directly in their path. That's a massive cloud in front of us. Yes, it is. We will not be going through that. I am going to request a heading. Why don't you so heading Quebec, Romeo, I'll have on course for you in about seven or eight miles once I get you past three scattered areas of heavy precipitation. Yeah, we're just going to talk to you about that. We're looking at it. It's uh, quite significant. You can see all this red here. Obviously, red is not a good thing. It's painting the uh, heaviest precipitation and uh, heavy precip comes out of thunderstorms. Air traffic control comes through, guiding them right around the thunderstorms to calm skies. There's the airport, I'm pretty sure. Airport's in sight. Now, they're closing in on the finish line. Which traffic to King Air is short final. This is uh, low approach only 3-1. Okay, dude, 140 knots, 200 feet. Roger. Miles northwest, inbound for left hand wind, 3 1, Quincy. Guess what? We're in Quincy. There she is, taking photos. Brad rolls the King Air to a stop, and here's his welcoming committee. Hey, we made it. We finally made it. How's it going? It's it felt awesome to see my mom. I mean, I haven't seen her forever. Yeah. Hey, mom, this is Pete. Hello. Hi. Nice my to partner meet you. in crime. <laughs> this is an absolutely gorgeous plane. It has to be fun to fly. We had fun. I think we made friends with it. Yep. Pete actually nicknamed it the Beast. The beast. And we had to tame the Beast. Are you going to miss her? I think I am going to miss the beast. Really? Yeah, it was a fun ride. It, it's always a fun ride, you know? And I'm going to shed a tear tonight when I see her in the rearview mirror. I'll tell you, it's worth a 300-mile drive. Yeah, how For about? as infrequently as we get together. The King Air is finally home. After a tough 7,600-kilometer flight across one of the most challenging routes in the world, we're done here, and then we're off to the next flight. What that is, we don't know yet. It could be South America, it could be Russia, it could be China. Each one has new challenges. That's part of the excitement. Over the Caribbean Sea, exhausted as they are, Corey and Randy have made it through a serious thunderstorm. The further we get away from this, the less problem it should be, so I'll be glad to get away from it. But now, a new problem. They're running out of daylight. That sun is setting fast. Randy switches from visual to instrument navigation. Scott, we're going to shoot this approach, but we're not going to mess around. Roger that. Next stop, the Joshua Airport in St. Vincent. An airstrip so dangerous, three planes have crashed trying to land after dark. You have to have a special clearance to land at night, even if you're an instrument-rated pilot. Corey and Randy don't have the clearance, so they're racing to beat the clock. Thank you, sir. We're cleared down to 1,500 feet, 9-1 uh, Whiskey Echo. But they might be too late. We would like to know whether you are checked out for night operations at the airport. OK, sir, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Uh, this is our first time at that airport, but uh, we are IFR-rated pilots. Randy hopes that being qualified to fly by instrument will get him a pass to land. It doesn't work. Permission to land is denied, and it couldn't come at a worse time. Now, this simple flight is quickly turning into a nightmare. Next time on Dangerous Flights. Okay, we're tired. Don't do anything stupid. Fatigue takes a toll. Damn it. Randy puts his foot down. We pushed it too hard, too long. Let's start talking about uh, taking tomorrow off. 
This is cool. It's like space shuttle. And a flying computer. Stop. Stop. What the hell was that? Has a mind of its own. Slow, 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 slow. It's like a caveman trying to figure out the 